Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll, and today we're going to go back into consciousness, not just the easy problem of consciousness, how the brain looks at the world and figures out what is where and how to respond to it, but the hard problem of consciousness, what makes us who we are, how we experience the world, what it is like to be us, that inner subjective first-person view that we have of reality. Now, if you've been following me for a while, you know that I'm a naturalist. I'm a physicalist, in fact, which means I think the world is made of stuff, obeying the laws of physics, and that's basically it. Except when that stuff comes together to form complicated things, like human beings, there can be new emergent phenomena that arise, and consciousness is one of those. Consciousness is just an aspect of the collective action of underlying stuff, obeying the laws of physics. But you will not be surprised to learn that there are those who disagree. And those who disagree need not be hardcore Cartesian dualists. They don't necessarily think that there's a disembodied mind that somehow interacts with the body. It can also be true that you believe the world is made of physical stuff, but the physical stuff has extra properties, mental properties. And this point of view drives you in the direction of panpsychism, thinking that everything is a little bit conscious. It's not just that something new happens when atoms and particles come together to form a brain, but that there was something that was there all along, and it becomes important and noticeable once you get something like an organism or a brain. So for today's guest, we have Philip Goff, who's a professor of philosophy at Durham University in the UK, and one of the leading thinkers on panpsychism. He is all for it. I am against it. So we have a very nice conversation. Philip is the author of an academic book called Consciousness and Fundamental Reality, and also a brand new, just published, popular level book called Galileo's Error, Foundation for a New Science of Consciousness. So I have fun in the podcast with the idea that I'm on Galileo's side and Philip is against Galileo's side. But basically, Philip is also pro-Galileo. He thinks that Galileo made a mistake in overly mathematizing the world that we live in, that there's a qualitative aspect to the world as well as a quantitative aspect. So you can listen to what we say back and forth about both sides of this. Mostly, as usual, I give Philip a chance to give his sales pitch for his side, but you can tell where my sympathies lie. Remember that if you want to support the podcast, you can go to the webpage, preposterousuniverse.com slash podcast. There you can find transcripts of every episodes and audio player and show notes, links to the person we're talking about, their Twitter bio and so forth. You can also find a Patreon link. So if you support on Patreon, you get the podcast without any ads, and you also get a monthly Ask Me Anything episode. And of course, you can go to Apple or iTunes and leave reviews for the podcast. We always like that. And with that, let's go. Philip Goff, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you very much. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited for this podcast because I think, I'm not completely sure, but I think this is the podcast on which uh, the guest and I disagree most strongly about most of the important things we'll be, uh -huh. <laughs> we'll be talking about, <laughs> but in a productive way. And I, you yeah. know, I really think, I, I read, you have a new book coming out. I read the book and uh, it's a fantastic book, very, very clear statement of the case that you want to make. And that case, of course, much. is for a panpsychist view of consciousness. So why don't we, I, you know, we had a, I had a previous interview with David Chalmers. And so some of the podcast listeners will have heard that, but not all of them. So let's not assume they know anything. Why don't you tell us why there's a problem with consciousness, what it is that we're trying to figure out when we talk about consciousness? Sure. Well, it's, it's a big discussion, but I think the core of the problem is that physical science works with a purely quantitative vocabulary, whereas consciousness is an essentially qualitative phenomenon, just in the sense that it involves qualities, the redness of a red experience, the smell of coffee, the taste of mint. Uh, and you can't capture, it seems, these qualities in the purely quantitative vocabulary of physical science, right? You can't capture in, in the quantitative language of neuroscience the redness of a red experience. And so it looks like as long as you're... you're um, 
your description of the brain is framed in a purely quantitative vocabulary, it seems that you're going to miss out these qualities of consciousness and thereby miss out an essential component of consciousness. So that, that, that's the way I like to, to frame the, the, the starting point of the philosophical problem, this clash between uh, the quantities and qualities, the quantities of physical science and the qualities we know from our own first-person conscious experience. So for people who do know a little bit about the issue, you're interested here in the hard problem of consciousness, that first-person mm -hmm, subjective mm -hmm. experience, less so in the easy problems about mm -hmm. how people behave and how we treat them as conscious creatures, you know, how they perceive the world and things like that. Yeah, I mean, look, there's all sorts of very important things we can do with, with neuroscience, and neuroscience is absolutely essential for making progress on consciousness. I'm a big fan of neuroscience and, you know, I try to keep as up to date as I can. But, I mean, I think essentially, here's another way of putting it, you know, what neuroscience gives us are correlations between um, brain activity and conscious experience. So you can scan people's brains, you can ask them what they're thinking and feeling, um, and you can get a rich body of information, correlation between certain kinds of brain activity and certain kinds of conscious experience. Uh, but that in itself is, is not the full story, because if we want a complete theory of consciousness, if we want, if you like, to move to solving the hard problem, we want to explain those correlations, right? We want to say, you know, why is it? Why is it when you have such and such brain activity, you have feeling of hunger or whatever? Um, and because of the purely quantitative vocabulary of physical science, it's hard to see how you can provide any such explanation. So yeah, so this, I mean, this, the starting point is, I mean, my starting point is we know that consciousness is real. Nothing is more evident than the reality of our feelings and experiences. So we have to find some way of integrating it into our scientific story. But we can and we can build correlations and that's fine and that's important but to give a kind of deeper explanation we come up against this difficulty of the essential qualitative nature of consciousness and the quantitative vocabulary of physical science so yeah that's the challenge yeah and just to preview a little bit i'm sure we'll get into this in more detail but my point of view, the point of view of someone like mm -hmm. me, which will label the materialist point of view uh, going forward, is that in some very real sense, there is literally nothing else to say once you've said what all of the physical stuff in the universe does, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That what we do when we talk about consciousness or even feelings of experiences and so forth is simply come up with a convenient label for a higher level emergent phenomenon that is ultimately mm -hmm. nothing more mm -hmm. than physical stuff doing things. And I think, and this is really where, you know, I, I, David, I guess, and I talked about this a little bit, but I think this is where our conversation is going to be very, very useful in digging into what exactly is meant by that distinction, like whether it is or can be a complete explanation just to say what stuff does. Yeah, and I mean, I, I think that's a coherent position you just described. And, um, you know, I, I, I read some of your most recent book and, um, yeah, and I was actually uh, to say that I was actually struck at how detailed you go into these these contemporary philosophical discussions, you know, because everything's so specialized these days. It's hard to <laughs> it's hard to you know learn about. I'm, I'm jealous of people in the 17th century where you could kind of know everything. <laughs> it's hard to. I know. I'm sure they be, complain too, but you know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there was you put quite a lot of research into um, these the details of these contemporary philosophical discussions, and yeah, I think that's a coherent position you describe. Um, but I, I suppose if you're going to defend that view, so, so maybe that's why I probably wouldn't set things up in the way Dave Chalmers does. I mean, that's been a hugely important, influential way of setting things up. But you might think it it's sort of already assuming what it's trying to prove, that, you know, neuroscience can just give us the easy problems, then there's this hard problem. Whereas you might say, I don't see why there's another problem. And, uh, yeah. 
But so, so what I would say is, okay, fine. That's a coherent position you've just described. And that would solve the problem if it made sense. But I think you then have an extra explanatory obligation, right? You've got to, you know, I, I would say, maybe you disagree. I would say that we know from our first person perspective, from our immediate uh, awareness of our own feelings, experiences, we know that consciousness has this qualitative nature. It involves these qualities, the redness of red experience and so on. Uh, and I think if you're going to be a materialist, then you owe us an explanation of how that is accounted for in the terms of physical science. How can you account for those qualities in the purely quantitative language of physical science? You know, you owe us an explanation, perhaps something like the explanation of, you know, the boiling point of water we can give in terms of chemistry. Uh, so, so, so I think there's at least an explanatory obligation there uh, for the materialist before we can say, okay, that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's perfectly fair. And uh, I'm biting my tongue because I want to try to, you know, give such an explanation, but I'll, I will give it later, or at least we'll we'll talk about it later in the podcast. But let, let's build our way up. I just wanted to preview for the audience, okay. you know, what the cool. stakes were a little bit. Um, you blame Galileo for people uh -huh. like me. This is, a, this is a very bold move in the book. You know, I mean, Galileo is not one uh -huh. of the people uh -huh. who we regularly <laughs> bash in pop side discussions. So, you know, maybe give the, the audience a clue as to what your beef is with Galileo. Sure. Well, you know, look, I'm a, I'm a big fan of Galileo here as well. I'm being a little bit provocative. Um, By the way, but, I was just uh, in Florence in Italy, and I don't know if you've ever been there, but there is a Galileo uh, museum where they keep his middle finger, uh, mm, the bones of his middle finger, as almost excellent. like a religious relic. So, uh, that was fantastic. And I had did, you, Alice... did you go and pay respects? I did. I did. You know, th there was no burning of incense or lighting of candles or anything like that. But uh, I did have Alice Drager as a podcast guest earlier, and she wrote a whole book called Galileo's Middle Finger, imagining that uh -huh. Galileo was giving the middle finger to uh, right. the rest of the world. But I don't think that gesture has the same meaning in Italy as it does here. But uh, anyway, yes, we don't actually want to worship Galileo or anybody yeah. else. So go ahead. So what's the issue with Galileo? So a key moment in the scientific revolution is Galileo's declaration that mathematics is to be the language of the new science. So the new science is to have a purely quantitative vocabulary. And so this is a much discussed moment. Uh, but what is less focused on, and what I focus on in my book, is the philosophical work Galileo had to do to get to that stage. Because before Galileo, people thought the physical world was filled with qualities. So there were colours on the surfaces of objects, smells floating through the air, s tastes inside food. Um, and this was a challenge for Galileo's um, aspiration to give a completely mathematical description of the physical world, because as we've already discussed, it's hard to see how you can capture those kind of qualities in a purely quantitative language. How can you capture in an equation the spiciness of paprika? So Galileo got around this by proposing a radically new philosophical theory of reality. And according to this theory, those qualities aren't really out there in the physical world. Uh, rather, they're in the, the the consciousness of the observer, which crucially Galileo took to be outside of the domain of science. So, so the redness isn't really on the surface of the tomato, it's, on, it, it's in the consciousness of the person perceiving the tomato, or the spiciness isn't really in the, inside the paprika, it's in the consciousness of the person eating it. Um, so, so Galileo, as it were, stripped the world of its qualities and after he'd done that, all that were remained were the purely quantitative features of matter. Size, shape, location, uh, motion, things that can be captured in mathematical geometry. Uh, so there is this radical division, radical dualism in, in Galileo's picture between the physical world with its purely quantitative properties, which is the domain of science, and consciousness with its qualities, which is outside of the domain of science. Um, so this is the start of mathematical physics, uh, 
um, which has obviously gone very well. <laughs> but, you know, crucially, it, Galileo at least only intended it to be a partial description of reality, right? The whole project was premised on setting consciousness outside of the domain of science. So I think this is really important because, so it, it, it's generally accepted now that consciousness does pose a serious scientific problem, which is not always the case. Um, but a lot of people have this following reaction. They say, okay, you know, there's a serious problem here, but you know, we just need to do more neuroscience and we'll sort it out. And I think the reason they think that is because they they look at the great successes of physical science in explaining more and more of our universe, and they think, you know, of course, one day it's it's going to crack consciousness. But the irony is, I would argue, that physical science has been so successful precisely because it was designed to ignore consciousness. That was the whole setup. So I think if, if Galileo were to time travel to the present day and hear about this hard problem of explaining consciousness in terms of physical science, he'd say, of course you can't do that. I designed physical science to deal with uh, qualities, not quantities. Sorry, the other way around. I designed physical science to deal with quantities, not qualities. So, so there's... The, 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 what I'm trying to push here, and we're, we're not really at the stage of arguments, it's a sort of narrative that I think, I, I, as a philosopher, I spend a lot of time on these fiddly arguments, and I think they're important, and maybe we can have some of those. But I think really, at the end of the day, it's it's the big picture that grabs people. Um, yeah. The big picture, such as you present in your book, you know, that, look, the success of science, physical science in particular, um, of course... It's going to explain consciousness one day, but I think actually there's a different way of looking at the history of science, such that that, that conclusion does not obviously follow. In fact, we're probably led in something of the opposite direction. That's, so that's the just main. so people know. In fact, yeah, your your book is entitled Galileo's Error: Foundations yeah. for a New Science of Consciousness. <laughs> so I'm happy to take the pro-Galileo point of view uh, for the rest of the podcast, while, while you take on the uh, the plucky underdog well, you, there. Well, hold uh, on, you should be a dualist if you're going to take the pro-Galileo position. Galileo's well, think, position. <laughs> no, I'm just. I, I think that I am what Galileo would have evolved into. That's that's my goal. Mm. Obviously, Galileo lived a long time ago, and uh, I, I don't really think this is jumping ahead once again. But I don't really think that. It's putting consciousness aside. I think that it is yeah. uh, understanding these quantitative features of the world as yeah. ways of talking about the qualitative features of the world. That's that's how I would put it. But um, I mean, but if first, I can just, can I yeah, just? Sure, I'm please. inclined to think I'm what Galileo would have evolved into because I think <laughs> I think Galileo took physical science very seriously, but he also took the qualitative reality of consciousness very seriously, and I and I think. You know, I, I think, uh, well, what we'll eventually get to is, is a way of bringing both together. And so, yeah, anyway. <laughs> From what <laughs> I know about Galileo's personality, he would not have been very happy with a book called Galileo's Error. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> but so good. Let's, uh, I think we have interesting things to talk about. So let's quickly dispatch what I think is the least interesting thing, which is the idea of dualism, right? The, you know, the old-fashioned Cartesian idea that there is a mind distinct from the body uh, without localization in space or time, immaterial, that somehow talks to it. So uh, mm -hmm. you're not in favor of that, and uh, neither am I, so let's explain why. Um, yeah, so I think maybe the problems of dualism are perhaps of a more straightforwardly scientific form. So maybe the problems of materialism are more philosophical in nature. Uh, problems of materialism, of dualism, sorry, are more straightforwardly scientific. Because, so most dualists, although they think the mind and the brain are distinct, uh, they they also want to hold that they stand in an intimate causal relationship. So that the you know when light hits the retina of the eye, makes changes in the brain, which will bring about visual experiences in in the soul, or vice versa. You know the decisions of the soul. To raise the arm, make changes in the brain, and cause the arm to go. So, so there's an intimate uh, causal relationship there. So, from my point of view, if there were an immaterial entity impacting on the brain every second of waking life, you know, I think that would really show up in our neuroscience. There'd be all sorts of things happening in the brain that had no physical explanation. It'd be like a poltergeist was playing with the brain. And I think that's not what we see. And so I think that gives us a, an ever-growing sort of inductive argument against dualism. So, I mean, I, I, w I wouldn't want to completely 
stop taking dualism seriously. I, you know, I'm, I'm open mind. I think there are a lot of, including David Chalmers himself, there are a lot of uh, interesting uh, work done on this. But to my mind, it's it, it's got a bit of a hurdle to overcome with, with those kind of problems. Yeah, and I completely agree with everything you said, and I said similar things in the big picture. Just, again, because people might have some familiarity with the discourse here, there is a distinction drawn between property dualists and substance dualists. Property dualists mm -hmm. thinking mm -hmm. that there is truly, the mind is truly another kind, sorry, substance dualists thinking that the mind is truly another kind of substance. Whereas, and I don't think the Chalmers is that. But property dualists thinking that there are different kinds of properties that physical stuff yeah. has, physical properties and mental properties. And I think that uh, Chalmers, to the extent that he will allow himself to be pinned down to any actual position, uh, is probably something closer to that. And maybe you have yeah. some sympathies along those lines, too. Yeah. So a more uh, this tends to the, the property dualist position tends to go along with, uh, at least in the day in David Chalmers case, the commitment to special psychophysical laws uh that so if you just had the laws of physics the thought is you wouldn't have consciousness we'd all be zombies but these special psychophysical laws that are as fundamental as the law of laws of physics because those laws are governing uh when you have certain physical states of affairs they give rise to consciousness actually i mean let me say it's interesting to say often when i'm talking to people who consider themselves materialists, they will often say, oh yeah, that, they, they often take that to be the view that the brain produces consciousness. Uh, but that's not materialism, right? That's dualism. If, if the brain produces consciousness, then consciousness is this extra stuff. So I, I actually think at least among um, sort of people just thinking about this in general, I think a, lo a, a lot of people who think themselves a materialist actually turn out to be property dualists. And when, when, and when I, I found actually when I explained to them what materialism is, they're like, oh, no, that's crazy. Of course that's not true. <laughs> they're horrified. <laughs> so, um, so, so, yeah, so you might find actually... But this is exactly why philosophy yeah. is important, right? Because people yeah, think sure. that they have a view on something and they haven't really thought it through and they talk in sloppy ways. And so exactly. you can exactly. analyze what's going on and go, no, 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 you, your implications are not quite what are implied by sure. your assumptions. Absolutely. Yeah. So, okay, good. So let's let's not even spend too much time. Well, we should pause to give credit to Princess Elizabeth, uh, who was the uh -huh. first to raise this problem of how the immaterial mind is supposed to interact with the body, mm -hmm. which is now growing mm -hmm. up to be mm -hmm. called the interaction problem. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, are there are there many actual hardcore substance dualists hanging around these days yeah. in philosophy departments? Just a quick word on Princess Elizabeth. It's so so. She was expressing worries about the intelligibility of the relationship between something physical and something non-physical. I think most people these days don't worry so much about that. It's more of, so that would be a more philosophical worry. The worry these days mm -hmm. is more an empirical concern of the sort we've been talking about. But are there many substance dualists? Actually, I'm, I'm not so sure Chalmers is not is not so unsympathetic to substance dualism, actually. And, um, or definitely Martina Nieder Rumelin, who's um, in the University mm -hmm. of Fribourg in uh, Switzerland, is a very excellent philosopher and substance dualist of some kind. Um, who, uh, but she's she's you know she's as I say in my book, she's a you know she's a passionate atheist, and she's she just thinks that the conscious mind is not physical, but it's a natural phenomenon that arises from the physical and it's law governed and um so i think i think actually she's motivated to substance dualism at least in part because of thoughts about identity over time i think okay. some substance dualism maybe we don't want to get into all that but uh some people are worried well, once about once the wave function know, of the universe starts branching into multiple copies it raises a whole other yeah. conundrum for yeah. uh, those kinds of things so. <laughs> yeah you're not going to be worried about it in that case yeah so um so i think that might be part of the motivation for such people but yeah all right yeah. so brushing that aside hundreds of years of uh, very difficult work in philosophy and and uh, consciousness studies um materialism so we have the yeah. idea post Galileo that you know we're made of these things we can describe them mathematically there is this always this slight footnote to trying to be a good materialist which is that 
what we think the material actually is changes over time, right? Like Galileo would have thought it's one yeah. thing and then atoms came along and then quantum mechanics came along. So it's hard even to pin down what you mean Absolutely. by materialism or physicalism. I will, I will grant that. But I think the basic idea is that there is stuff. The stuff obeys the laws of physics. The laws of physics are impersonal, right? They're equations, maybe differential equations, maybe something more advanced than that. Um, and that's it in some level. We could talk about the entire world in just those terms, but that then there are other higher level ways, sort of useful effective theories or whatever you want to call them, uh, which come closer to our folk view of the world where there are people and intentions and thoughts and, and, and so forth. Uh, so you're not on board with that very sensible perspective. Do you want Actually, to give us your favorite arguments against it? Oh, yeah. Actually, I'm not. I don't want to get lost, don't put in, words in, your lost, mouth. Yeah. lost in definitions to, <laughs> at, the, at the start, but. Actually, I'm not sure any of that was inconsistent with panpsychism. You said actually, the uh, um, I did say I mean, all there is. Uh, well, maybe we'll get to that later. I mean, just I mean, the way I would define materialism, actually, uh, I don't know if you is that fundamental nature reality can be captured with a purely quantitative vocabulary involving um, just mathematical and causal terms. Um, so that that's at least part of the definition. Um, would you be happy with that? Does that? Well, I, I I'm willing to be happy with it. What, when you say it out loud, it strikes me as odd because we're trying to define materialism. And mm -hmm. the operative words in your definition were things like math and quantitative. And uh, yeah. that seems to be a slight sliding of uh, what you're really aiming at here. I mean, my, my definition, whatever it would be, and I don't claim to have the world's most perfect definition, but um, stuff obeying the laws of physics, and that's a complete description. Like, there's no extra yeah. properties over and above right. the physical properties. But the that's, that's the, the important thing for me. The panpsychist thinks that as well. Well, well, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. Okay, okay. But, uh, let's come back to that. But you don't. Uh, so let, let's put it this way. Let's operationalize it. You don't agree with materialism, so tell me why <laughs> yeah, you don't agree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Get lost. Get lost. Philosophers get lost in pedantry. No, it's important. I'm very happy yeah. to do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, well, it really comes back to the to to what we were talking about earlier. So, I mean, maybe here's another way of putting it. I, I know from your perspective. So, what is the job of a theory of reality? What, what are we trying to, you know, what's the data for a theory of reality? And I guess, I think, I think you, you'd think that the data is the data of observation and experiment, right? If you've, if you've got a theory that can account for, very roughly, maybe you want to nuance it, if you can account for all of the data of observation experiment in the most satisfying, elegant, simple way, you know, job done. Whereas I think that's, that's not enough. There's something, there's another bit of data, there's something else we know to be real, uh, namely consciousness. And it's not something we know from observation and experiment. You know, if you look inside someone's head, you can't see their feelings and experiences. So if, you know, if you're just, aim is just to account for observation experiment, then you never have any reason to postulate consciousness, as I think Daniel Dennett is wonderfully consistent on this. But we do know that consciousness exists. We know it from our immediate awareness of our own feelings and experiences. In fact, I think Descartes was right that it's the reality of consciousness is known with a greater certainty than anything about the external world. And that's an extra datum that needs to be accounted for. Uh, and we can't assume from the start that the postulations we made to account for observation experiment will also account for this other data. In fact, you know, in a way, it would be strange if it did, right? Given that, you know, what you deal in, the postulations you deal in are tailored for a specific purpose, explaining observation experiment. It would be kind of a weird coincidence if they also explained uh, these subjective qualities that we're aware of in a completely different way. Um, so that's just a sort of prima facie thing. But, but then... Coming to the crux of it, I think there's, there's, there's good reason to think that the postulations of physical science alone cannot account for the reality of consciousness. And, and again, it's coming back to the issue that consciousness has a purely, uh, sorry, consciousness has a qualitative nature, whereas um, 
physical science deals with this purely quantitative vocabulary. So let, let me put the point again in a slightly different way. You cannot convey... So I, I, th I don't think it's just that... When people have heard about Dave's hard problem, sometimes they think, oh, we just haven't got the solution yet. So, but I think that's to not to get to the philosophical core of here of this. The problem is you cannot even capture the qualities of consciousness in the language of neuroscience. And one way to see that is you know, if you could, if you could capture what it's like to see red in the language of neuroscience, you could convey to a blind from birth neuroscientist what it's like to see red, the qualitative qualitative character of red experience which seems absurd. You know, you can only know what it's like to see red when you actually have a red experience. So I don't think you can even, because of its limited vocabulary, I don't think you can even capture the qualities of consciousness in the language of neuroscience. So that's a kind of expressive limitation. And I think that expressive limitation implies an explanatory limitation. You know, because if, if you were going to explain the qualities of consciousness in the language of neuroscience, I th it seems to me you'd have to convey those qualities in the language of neuroscience and then explain them in more fundamental physical terms. If you can't even convey them, you can't even express them, then I don't think you can explain them. So I think there are good in principle reasons to think, uh, you know, neuroscience alone, physical science alone, because of its quantitative vocabulary, can't give us a complete account of this phenomenon we know to be real. So it, it it can't be complete. It can't be true. Yeah, and I think, that, good, this is exactly what I really wanted to dig into. Uh, I completely agree that consciousness is real. I've never been very sympathetic to people who said it was an illusion. I mean, Dennett, uh, I think he's maybe less consistent or less clear yeah, than uh, you give him credit for, because, sure. uh, like, he gets upset when people say he denies the reality of consciousness, or you yeah. know, but he does sometimes seem to be calling it an illusion, and I, 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 I'm not sure where to land. Yeah. But I don't think it's an illusion. I think it's a higher yeah. level emergent phenomenon. But I think that's a very different thing. Um, yeah. uh, so I'm torn. Let me let me. I'll give you two choices. I want to talk about zombies. I want to talk about intrinsic natures. Which do you think makes sense to talk about first? Uh, let's go with zombies before. Yeah, before answering, because I, I want to get into the details of what you just said, but a nice little, you know, um, thought experiment on the table would be useful. So give me your version of the of the zombie argument. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't tend to... You prefer zombies rather than Mary? <laughs> uh, I think, yeah, no, Mary's like, easy. Mary, I, I, yeah. I mean, even, even Frank Jackson, who invented Mary, uh, gave up on her eventually. So I, I, I think I'm on firm ground there. So why don't you um, uh, tell us about Mary the Color Scientist? Yeah, I, I think I prefer Mary in some way. I, I, it seems to always get it gets very technical. The zombie argument, I think. Um, right. So Mary I actually, is this, sorry. I mean, just sorry, to, just to put ahead. it on on the table. I think that zombies are the world's best argument against panpsychism. Which so I, I do want to talk about uh -huh. that at some point. But okay, we can talk okay, about Mary okay, first. Okay. Cool. Um, so I think it's a way of it's really just a way of explicating and giving further to support to what I've already been talking about. So Mary is this genius color scientist who knows everything neuroscience can teach you about color experience. So, you know, the wavelengths hitting the eyes, the changes that makes in the brain, how it gives rise to various forms of behavior. But for some reason that's never explained, she's been raised in a black and white room, right? <laughs> I think there yeah, are the, the easier backstory, ways. The exposition is not very good, but okay. <laughs> I mean, I think in a way we could have just had a colorblind neuroscientist or something. Uh, there's this guy Nut Norby, who's a uh, who's um, a color expert who can only see black and white and shades of gray, and has written some interesting yeah. stuff from his own position. Anyway, uh, right. Anyway, so let's come back to Mary. So. So she knows everything there is to know, everything neuro sorry, I should say everything neuroscience can teach you about colour experience. And then one day but she's never actually seen colours because of this black and white room. And one day, again not explained, she's liberated from a black and white room and she sees colours for the first time. So the proponent of the knowledge argument says at this point she learns something new. She learns um, what it's like to see colour. Uh, one problem with this is, so that's the story, 
And people, because the story is so simple, I think people are often too quick to think they've got the argument. Um, but so here's the argument, the knowledge argument that's based on this story. The thought is, if, if materialism is true, then in principle, neuroscience ought to be able to give us a complete story of the essential nature of colour experience, a complete account of what's going on. Mary, by stipulation, knows that, so there ought to be nothing more she can learn about the nature of colour experience. She knows it all. Um, as I, the, the analogy I give in my book is, you know, if you've got the complete final theory of black holes, right, you ought to be able to, it ought to be the case that you can't learn anything new, any new essential features of black holes, because you've got the complete final theory. So it ought to be, if materialism is true, there's nothing more let Mary can learn. And yet, uh, when she comes out of her room, she does gain some new information about the essential nature of colour experience. Uh, she learns what it's like to see colour. And this is information that couldn't be got from the neuroscience. And so, and so in some sense, the neuroscientific account must have been incomplete because there's information about colour experience that goes beyond what the neuroscience can provide. And, and then, so just to link it back to what I've been talking about a lot already, what is that information? What does she learn? She learns about the qualitative character of colours, the redness of a red experience, that's what um, a congenitally blind neuroscientist, no matter how much neuroscience they learn, will never know about. So there's, there's information there that goes beyond what neuroscience can capture. That's the, so that was a bit long-winded. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, the, this is good. Uh, um, so here's what I would say about that. Um, I mean, let me, I have a long thing to say. Let me just say the short thing. Uh, if... Mary knows everything about the neuroscience of color. That is to say, what exactly happens in a human brain when a human being looks at something that is red? Uh, clearly, that is different from experiencing red. Uh, sure. No one argues with that, sure. right? Um, and so it, the analogy to me is if I give you all the laws of um, particle physics and atomic physics and gravity and so forth, and you know them, and you have the equations in front of you, and then I say, okay, uh, tell me about the life cycle of a star. Well, that's, in principle, you could figure it out. In practice, there's an enormous amount of work to do. In mm -hmm. principle, Mary could say, okay, all I need to do is to have my neurons fire in the following way, which are the ways that they fire if I were seeing red. So I will hook myself up to the correct electrostimulator machine, and I will make those neurons fire in the right way, mm -hmm. and I will experience the experience of red. And I don't see anything in there that gets in the way of being a materialist. Yeah, but look, if you're learning the theory of black holes, so yeah, look, I completely agree. I think this is, I think there's a little bit of a, people say, always think the argument is about I've heard about the change in Mary. Um, you know, that, that, oh, how come she can't, she knows all the neuroscience, how come she can't experience red? That's, that's not the argument. Of course, of course, you know, the materialism, the materialist does not have to deal, that's not a problem for the materialist. But look, look notice the disanalogy, right? To know the relevant facts about black holes, are you... You picked a complicated example, but let me start again. To know all the facts about black holes, you don't have to become a black hole, right? It ought to be yeah. the case that you can know everything there is to know about colour experience from the neuroscience of materialism. Is true. I'm not saying you ought to be able to experience colours. No, that's not the point. You ought to be able to know all the facts from the neuroscience. And you've just conceded that you can't do that. You have to. She has to have changes in her neurons. Why? Why does she have to do that if materialism is true? If materialism is true, all the information should be there in the neuroscience, and she's got it. You know, you don't have to turn yourself into a black hole to learn the theory of black holes. Why do you have to make changes to your brain to know the full theory of um, what color experience is? Yeah, I mean, I think it's because you've set up the question in a certain way, like. Uh, it, it, you, you need to be a black hole to know what it is like to be a black hole. And, of course, the difference, which, which, I, which I completely agree with, is that black holes 
don't have uh, self-awareness or, or thoughts or anything like that. So you can argue that there isn't anything that it's like to be a black hole. Uh, I, I concede that there is something it is like to be a person, but uh, that's because we have the capacity to hold in our brains representations of ourselves and uh, you know attitudes towards things. And therefore, it's not, I would say that's not a very good analogy. There is something that, that is different even if you're a materialist. Do you think there's information, Mary in her black and white room, do you think there's information about the nature of colour experience she doesn't have? Um, in principle, no. But, right. but again, I'm, I'm conceding that it is different to know a bunch of facts about neuroscience and to experience something. I just think that from knowing those facts about neuroscience, you can experience something without actually experiencing it. You can make your brain do the things that it would do if you were experiencing it, and that would be the same as actually experiencing it, because all that's happening is things that are happening in your neurons. So I think there's two different things going on here. One is a question of complexity, the, the in-principle question. And that was your, your life cycle of a star, or what was it, the, the life of a star? Yeah. Uh, and this is something Dennett often presses. And I think it's a little bit of a red herring. It, it's, 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 it's maybe an unfortunate consequence of the way Jackson set up the thought experiment. He said, you know, she knows everything physical, you know, every quark and every... But I don't think you need to set it up like that. Presumably, you know, the future neuroscientific theory is just going to be, you know, a natural extension of what we have today. So I, I, I don't think it's impl implausible to think a, a normal human being could know that. So I, I don't think, so I, I think we can set on one side these worries about in principle knowing. The point is, as you accept, to, there's some information here that you have to make changes to your brain to get that information. And I'm suggesting if materialism is true, that's weird. Why would you have to make changes to your brain to, to get the information? So look, we're, we're all, let me put it, we're all agreeing that you have to make changes to have the experience. But I suppose the way, why do you have to have the experience to get the information? That, that's I the think, question. Yeah, I, yeah. I, that doesn't seem even a little bit surprising to me. Like I could tell you in gruesome detail the correct way to shoot a free throw in basketball. And you can sit at your desk and you yeah. can study everything there is to know about shooting a free throw. Yeah, yeah. And if you've never shot a free throw before, you're not going to be very good at it. Because the way that we learn okay. things okay. through our eyes and our ears and recording okay. information is just different than how our body reacts to these things. That's okay. not surprising as a materialist. Uh, okay. okay, good, good. So now, now, what you, now what you're presenting, I think, is what's known as the ability hypothesis response, right? Which is which is originally by, uh, what's his name? Nemirov, Leonard Nemirov, was it? And, uh, but is was defended by David Lewis, who's quite a big figure in philosophy, philosophy generally. Um, so, so anyway, the, the view is here. So I keep trying to press on you information. There's information Mary can't get in their black room. But what, what, what Lewis says is, and Nemirov, she, know, she doesn't gain new information. She gains new know-how, new abilities. That's what she learns. She learns how to imagine red, categorize things as red, um, remember red, and so on. So she gains new know-how. Now, that, now that's, that would, that's a perfectly good response because then, yeah, neuroscience gives you all the information. Um, she just gained some new abilities. That, that, that's not a problem for materialism. Okay, so I think there are a couple of problems with this response. Uh, do you want a technical one or an intuitive one? Give us both. Give us whatever you think um, you want. I'll let you decide. Technical is fine. We're not, we're, we have an hour long here. You know, it's plenty of time. The technical one um, is it seems you can put these sentences about what it's like to see red into deductive syllogisms. So you could say, Mary could say, if this is what it's like for me to see red, then this is what it's like for Billy to see red. This is what it's like for me to see red. Therefore, it is what it's like for Billy to see red. So there's a valid truth-preserving argument there. Now, forget whether the premises are true or false, but it see, that seems to show that, the, that these what it's likeness sentences are truth claims. And the problem with the ability mm. hypothesis is it, it it doesn't have any account of that. It just talks about abilities. Um, but abilities are not the same as truth claims. Um, 
So that's the sort of... Well, this is actually, I mean, maybe maybe it would be helpful to talk a little bit about intrinsic natures, which I mentioned before mm-hmm. and you mm-hmm. talk about in the book, because I think that this is the fundamental underlying issue that we have that, you know, Galileo and I have with, <laughs> with you and Panpsychist, the idea that... Um, Galileo's on my I, side. If, uh, well, you know, <laughs> I didn't write a book saying you made an error. So, you know, yeah, you, sorry. you built your house, you got to live in it. Sorry, um, I'll stop interrupting that. I think, yeah, so, well, I mean, why don't you say, I shouldn't put words in your mouth. Why don't you tell us what you mean by uh, the idea that physics doesn't tell us, physics tells us what things do, but it doesn't tell us about their trin- intrinsic natures. And this is also, it goes back to Bertrand Russell, right? And um, yeah. uh, I, I actually learned from your book that Russell was uh, one, of the, one of the big names in panpsychism. I didn't know that. Yeah, well, actually, Russell, as I put in some of the footnotes, didn't quite have a panpsychist interpretation of it, but... He didn't quite get it's, there, yeah. It, it's as close as, damn it, just because he had some funny terminological issues. But anyway, yeah, so I think actually there's been a real resurgence of interest um, in panpsychism in academic philosophy in the last eight or ten years. It's gone from being laughed at insofar as it was thought of at all to being taken quite seriously. And I think this is largely due to the rediscovery of this work, important work from the 1920s by uh, Arthur Eddington, scientist, and Bertrand Russell. So I'm inclined to think these guys did in the 1920s for the science of consciousness what Darwin did for the science of life uh, in the 19th century. And it's sort of a tragedy of history that it got kind of forgotten about. Um, Okay, so the starting point is, as you were just alluding to, that physics tells us a lot less than you might think about the nature of physical reality. Um, So in the public mind, physics is giving us this complete story of the nature of space and time and matter. Uh, But what Russell and Eddington realise is actually, upon reflection, it turns out that physical science is confined to telling us about the behaviour of matter, about what it does. So physics talks about mass and charge, you know, we characterize mass in terms of gravitational attraction, resistance to acceleration, charge is characterized in terms of attraction and repulsion. This all concerns what particles or fields do, right? Physics is completely silent on um, what philosophers like to call the intrinsic nature of a physical entity, how it is in and of itself, independently of its behavior. Um, and so so this is sometimes called the problem of intrinsic natures. It looks like there's this huge hole in our scientific story of the universe. And then, so what? just the link to consciousness very briefly, um, I think the genius of Russell and Eddington was to bring together two problems that on the face of it have nothing much to do with each other. The problem of consciousness and the problem of intrinsic natures. Uh, So the problem of consciousness is roughly the need to find a place for consciousness in our scientific story. The problem of intrinsic natures is that we have this huge hole in our scientific story of the universe. So the unified solution is put consciousness in the hole, right? So we're looking for a place for consciousness. We've got this big hole, put consciousness in the hole. So the resulting theory is a kind of panpsychism. You've There's just matter or just physical stuff, fields maybe. There's nothing spiritual or supernatural. But physical reality can be described, as it were, from two perspectives. Physical science describes it, as it were, from the outside, tells us rich information about its behavior. Uh, But as it were, from the inside, its intrinsic nature is constituted of forms of consciousness. So this is a beautifully simple, elegant, unified way of uh, integrating consciousness into our scientific worldview. And in contrast to dualism, it's consistent with everything we know empirically. So so from my perspective, just final sentence, um, we've got this challenge of how do we bring together what we know empirically about the physical world from natural science and what we know, this qualitative reality we know from our immediate awareness of consciousness this gives us a way of bringing them together in a way that's entirely consistent with both. Yeah, so that's, that's, that's the big picture of the, the view I try to defend.
Yeah, and I think the reason why I wanted uh, to bring that up right now is because it is the underlying, to me, the underlying source of, of all of our other disagreements in, in some sense. Like, I totally would buy the idea that once you've told me what the stuff does, mm. uh, you're done. There isn't anything yeah. else. There yeah. is no such thing as the intrinsic nature of stuff. And I think, yeah. maybe, you know, maybe this is where you can educate me. I think that r reflects back onto our discussion about Mary, the whether or not, or, or just more, more generally what it is like to be something. Um, I think what it is like to be something, what it is like to experience red, uh, ultimately is a description of certain things going on in our neurons and our bodies. And, uh, I don't have a strong opinion about whether or not there are truth claims associated with that that are sort of uh, intermined. Like, you know, the, the, the old question of, you know, whether the red I see is the same as the red you see, uh, I'm not sure whether that has a sensible explanation, but I do think that when I say I'm experiencing red, that not only correlates exactly with certain neurons doing something in my brain, but is just a way of saying that certain neurons are doing yeah. something in my brain. So I think that that is the same as the uh, intrinsic nature disagreement. Is that um, fair? Let me just say one thing briefly that I, I wouldn't, I think you do have a coherent position and I wouldn't describe it as denying the reality of consciousness. I think you, you, you had these yeah. dialogues in your book of sort of people think that's denying consciousness and, <laughs> Maybe some of my anti-physicalist comrades w w would say that, but uh, I, 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 if that view works out, I think it's it, it's clearly accepting the reality of consciousness. You know, I just don't think it's ultimately coherent. Sure. But um, that was just a brief point. I, I'm I'm not inclined to agree that this comes down to whether we need intrinsic natures. You know, to my mind, that's as distinct and, you know, more contentious view. I, I can imagine being persuaded. We could look at some of the arguments, if you want, as to why we need to postulate intrinsic natures at all. But I can imagine being persuaded that, sure, we don't need, there's a coherent picture of the world in which there's that there's no intrinsic natures. And so, I on this kind of view, things are just doings rather than beings you know once you've said what it does mm -hmm. you've said everything but i still think i would i, I would i would think well there's this qualitative reality what about these qualities um we need some account of them and i i haven't yet heard an explanation in term in, in physical science terms so i and i would push these arguments that there are in principle reasons to thinking that can't be done. So, I guess I would be inclined to think these are the, these are distinct issues. Um, I mean, I guess where where, I, where it became unclear to me is um, when you bring up the qualitative features, the qualitative mm. experiences, and so forth. I mean, that maybe I'm getting this wrong, but it kind of at least reminds me, resonates with the idea that there is something right. over and above what the things are doing. And maybe it's not intrinsic nature, yeah, but it's still okay, something good. over and above what things are doing. So maybe put it like this. I guess I think there are two reasons why we need intrinsic natures. Um, one, I'm not sure it's intelligible to have a picture of the world without them. Forget about consciousness, and we could get into those arguments maybe or not. Um, but the other is there is this reality we know about and it's hard and it's hard to see how you can account for it in causal structural terms um but that's a that, that, that's in a way there's two steps to that argument right one is there is this datum we need to account for and secondly it's to my mind there are good arguments why it can't be accounted for in causal structural terms so I suppose there, you, yeah, you get the implication that it's a kind of intrinsic nature. Um, yeah, yeah, maybe that's right. But it's, but it's. I mean, maybe it is yeah. worth. I, w I want to give you a chance to give the positive case, uh, an explanation for panpsychism, which we've kind of only alluded to so far. But um, I think because I do think that this kind of. Uh, 
uh, divergence is at the heart of our, all of our divergences. Maybe it is worth saying yeah. some words about why you think that intrinsic natures really are necessary. If I if I knew all of the mathematical structures and causal relationships uh, among the physical stuff of the universe and could say what everything did, there would still be something lacking. So I don't think there's anything right. lacking once that happens. And you do. Tell me, tell us why. Okay, let's get into that argument. But I think I've just clarified for myself what's going on. So let me, you know, I think it's, you seem to be saying that the, 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 I believe in intrinsic natures because I think consciousness is irreducible, not the other way around, right? So it's, it's not like I start off saying, oh, there must be these intrinsic natures. Um, it's because of consciousness. But but also I do think there must be intrinsic natures. So so maybe we could, <laughs> maybe, maybe we could get into that again. So I guess people... They might be logically separate, but they're in the same spirit. That's all I would say. Right, right. Those two facts. Yeah, it's an interesting thought. It might be something I might have to think a little bit more about. Um, so people... Um, defending this this Russell Eddington picture, going right back to Russell, have tried to defend this this kind of argument to the conclusion that a world without intrinsic natures is just unintelligible. And you know, I go a little bit back and forward on these arguments, I have to say. I'm not I'm not um I'm not a hundred percent committed. But the thought is without intrinsic natures, everything ends up being defined in terms of everything else, and you end up in a kind of vicious circle. So I have an appendix to one mm -hmm. of the chapters of my book. So the thought is, you know, you start off saying, what's mass? And you say, you know, let's just keep things simple. Let's ignore general relativity. And, you know, you just say, oh, it's, sure. it's uh, you know, it causes gravitational attraction. And you say, and they say okay, well, uh, what's, what's attraction? And you say, well, it's, you know, it's when, I don't know, the distance between bodies is decreased. And you say, well, what's distance? And then you kind of get another bunch of equations that explicates distance in terms of other physical properties like mass and charge and you quickly find yourself back in a circle and without any way of getting an independent grip on any of these properties it looks like these definitions just don't get off the ground so the analogy i give in the book is suppose i've got three matchboxes and i say uh there's a in the first one there's a splurge in the second one is a blurge and in the third one is a curge and you say what's a blurge and I say, oh, that's easy. It's uh, the blurge is something that makes splurges. You say, okay, well, I don't know what that means until I know what a splurge is. What's a splurge? And I say, oh, a splurge is the thing that makes curges. And you say, well, I don't know what that means either until I know what a curge is. And I say, well, it's a thing that makes splurges. And you don't know what the hell is in the matchboxes. So I sort of think that's actually how, and this is how Russell thought, this is actually how physics works. It Everything's interdefined. And... So without a kind of independent grip, we, we, we don't really get an understanding of, of what any of these things are. So that, that was the kind of argument he pressed. What do you reckon? Yeah, I will, I'll just very quickly uh, say why I did not find that argument convincing, but I'm glad that it's out there. I, I agree that an individual term like mass can't yeah. be defined yeah. w without talking about other things. There's absolutely yeah, yeah. interconnectedness. But rather than, <clears throat> excuse me, rather than circularity, I would just say one defines an entire formal system. Sure. Space-time is a four-dimensional manifold, with Lorentzian metric, blah, 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 blah. And there's a whole bunch of individually very well-defined parts of that formal system. And then one maps it on to the data of our experience and says, we've explained the world. I don't think it's circular. Um, I do think it's interconnected, so I'm not convinced. There you go. But what if I say, you know, what is a field? Tell me what a field is. Oh, a field is a section of a fiber bundle. <laughs> I mean, right. it's uh, th th these are there is a mathematical formalism, and I can pinpoint individual parts of it. So I don't care yeah. to talk about the intrinsic nature of them. That's that's my escape hatch, right? If I don't care about what it really is, if I just care about where it is in the math, then I'm done. But, uh, I mean, even if you're taking, yeah, so look, this depends, there are a couple of different issues here. One is, there are two subtly related views. I mean, I guess you're defending a kind of what's sometimes called ontic structuralism, that in some sense there's just structure. But there are, there are two closely related views here. One is a, a pure structuralism where there's just what can be captured mathematically. Another is causal structuralism, which is a little bit more modest. It's what can be captured with mathematics 
and causal terms. Um, and on that view, we, we, we ultimately define the nature of things in terms of what they do. Um, would you say that you were going for the former or the latter? I think I'm the former, yeah. I'm not a big right, fan of right. causal terms at fundamental ontology. Right, right. So, so the world can be just entirely captured in, in mathematical language. Yeah, so there is the world, and there is a, a mathematical formal system, and there's an isomorphism between them. And, to, you know, it's all complicated, and philosophy is necessary, because there's also yeah, our yeah. folk experience of the world, which is like sure. a third thing that we have to map onto both of those in interesting ways. But it's, it's a coherent set of interconnections, not a circular argument. That's, that's the yeah. distinction. Okay, well, I think in that case, maybe we... I, because you're sympathetic to a kind of human. I think maybe we've been talking slightly at cross purposes because um, that argument is is more an attack on people who want to take causation as a fundamental feature, and we de define the nature right. of say an electron in terms of what it does. Uh, yeah, I think that problem goes away a little bit if you just think. And in fact, there has been a, a reply to there was a volume of essays on on this this form of panpsychism and Alyssa Ney, who's a philosopher, very good philosopher of physics mm -hmm. is replying in, ex in, in exactly these ways, arguing that, um, that, you know, we could just have the wave function or something in a, expressed in completely mathematical yeah. language. Um, just parenthetically, uh, I am the author of an idea called Mad Dog Everettianism, uh -huh, where uh -huh. uh, literally all that exists is a vector sure. in a giant Hilbert space representing the universe and a Hamiltonian that tells us how it evolves. And uh -huh. everything else, space, time, matter, particle fields, are just particular human constructions to conveniently talk about what that wave function does over time. Sure. Yeah, so... so so I guess at that point, what what I would say is, okay, maybe, um, are you familiar with Newman's problem? Have you heard that expression? Uh, I've, I've heard of it, but I couldn't explain it. So why don't you explain it? Yes. Well, the problem is, I, I can't remember the details either, but... Uh, yeah, okay. So, oh, so, uh... so the, I mean, the way I've thought about these things is the, 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 the causal structuralism faces this regress problem and the more pure structuralism faces Newman's problem. But it's a while mm. since I've, I've looked at the details of Newman's problem, so I don't think I'd be able to defend that. But let's say, let's say you persuade me that, uh, that, that, that the mad dog Everettianism you've just described is, um, describes a possible reality, uh, yeah. and that that theory can account for data, all the data of observation experiments. Um, then I then I'd say fine, that's that's fair enough. But I'd say well look, there's this other datum. What, how do you account for this uh, of of of, of, of the qualitative reality of consciousness? And and then we'd be back to the knowledge argument. We'd be back to mm -hmm. to my claim that you can't account for that in a purely quantitative vocabulary. So so in a way, look, I I just think. The reality of consciousness is a datum in its own right over and above the data of experiments and observation. So if, if you've got a theory that can account for all the data of observation experiments, but you can't account for this, then your theory doesn't work. And you said, I mean, I guess you've said, okay, of course, you're not going to want to deny consciousness. But, you know, in all of the cases, that's an option, right? That's if, you know, that there are lots of phenomena that are, that are difficult to fit into our scientific worldview. You know, facts about value, that I know you're interested in, facts about free will, abstract objects, solidity in some sense, maybe our folk notion of solidity or our folk notions of time. In all of these cases, um, it's at least an option to either deny the phenomenon or revise our understanding of it. You know, maybe there aren't really facts about value, Maybe we're not really free in the way we think we are. Uh, maybe time isn't how we thought it was. But I think with consciousness, it's a reality that we know in such a direct way that I don't think it's an option to either deny it or revise it. So I think it's, it, it has a very special place in our methodology. And because of that, one needs to be hesitant about whether 
the stuff we postulated to account for observation experiments can also account for this. And I haven't heard from you yet a story about how that's done. I've, you've said that it can do it, but you haven't told me how it does it. Well, I, yeah, I don't think we've done it yet. So that, there you go. Ah. I mean, I'm very happy to, to admit that. Uh, but okay. my my the extent to which I'm impressed with materialism is just so vast that, of course, consciousness being involved with the most complicated structures we know of in the universe will be the last thing that science successfully explains, not because it mm. requires something separate, just because it's hard. You know, that's why it's hard. But anyway, I, I think we could get stuck here. Rather, I would I, I want you to um, really, I you know, here is the chance. Sure. Can I just sure. say something briefly? I mean, I think that's where it comes back to the Galileo point precisely. Maybe let's not get to, you know, it, it's that, yeah, science is, is, is so impressive, but it's impressive at a very limited task, d describing the behavior of matter, roughly, mathematical models that capture. It was never in the business of accounting for subject these subjective qualities that we're immediately aware of. That's never what it's been doing. So, like, to say, oh, it's... It's been good at this one thing, so it's going to be good at this other thing. I just think there's something confused going on there. Uh, I mean, I have this analogy in my book that when I was first, my first year as a lecturer, the head of department very kindly let me off administration. And I was pretty good at the other aspects of the job. I was pretty good at teaching, pretty good at research. The fact that I was good at teaching and research doesn't give you any reason to think I'm going to be good at admin, <laughs> right? So right. similarly, the, sure. fact that, the fact that physics has been really good, physical science more generally, really good at these mathematical models to describe behavior, why does that give you any reason to think it's going to be able to capture these subjective qualities that we're immediately aware of? Um, anyway... But, yeah, sorry. No, no, actually, that, that, I, I, that's wonderful. I'm glad you said that. Let me respond to it, and we'll see whether or not we can restrain ourselves from going back okay. and forth. But, I'll, I'll definitely um, stop. I, I, I think that's crucially important because when you have something like consciousness, uh, it's like when you have any part of scientific explanation or, you know, broader philosophical explanation that isn't finished yet, right? Uh, we admit that we don't have the full understanding. None of us does. And therefore, as individual scholars and researchers, we make bets. We have credences about what the, is the most likely future path of progress, right? And I talk about this in my upcoming book. I, I, I kind of breeze through it in the big picture, but in something deeply hidden where I'm talking about quantum mechanics, I think that it helps illuminate why some people are cheerful Everettians and some people find it to be abhorrent and therefore go for hidden variables or something like that. And it's because we, we, we do have the world of our experience, um, our, you know, sort of objective data collecting experience and our subjective inner experience. Let's lump it all into one thing. And we haven't yet fully explained it. And which is more likely uh, among the following two options? Number one is uh, an explanation that is more or less close to the phenomena that we're observing, like the structures within the explanation. There's a lot of them, and it's kind of a complicated you know, set of things going on, but the map between those structures and what we experience and what we see is very clear and crisp and easy. That would be a hidden variable approach to quantum mechanics, where, of course, there's particles and waves in the double slit experiment because there's particles and waves in my ontology. Or the other option is uh, you have an extremely beautiful, austere, simple, powerful underlying formalism, but the road from there to explaining the world of our experience is long and fraught with peril, right? That's the Everettian uh, perspective where, you know, like I said, you just have one vector in a big Hilbert space and you have a lot of work to do to say why the world looks like three-dimensional space plus time with fields and, and all that stuff. And... Either one of those options mm. is very much on the table, and there is a matter of taste or style that comes into saying, oh, I'm pretty sure it's this one, right? And I think likewise for consciousness. Like, of course, we have not explained consciousness in any convincing way as materialists, um, but... I, I have no trouble believing that it will eventually happen because materialism is so beautiful and elegant and so powerful. And, and, and I get, even if I don't agree with, the perspective that says, I just don't see how we'll ever get here from there. And, you know, I think that's a perfectly valid uh, uh, perspective and we'll, I, I think the progress will be made and we'll figure it out. And do you think, where, do you think when, we, when we get the final physical explanation, it will be able to convey to a congenitally blind neuroscientist what it's like to see red? Uh, by going in and manipulating their brain, yes. Not by talking to them. <laughs>
So it can't give all the information. Just like I can't teach someone I can't teach someone to be a good free throw shooter by talking to them either. Okay. But anyway, this is where no, we're getting no, into yeah, the spiral. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know. Okay. Our points just, of view well, are well, out just, there. Uh, let me. Uh, this is yeah. not a. This, this is not getting back to it. But I mean, I completely agree with that whole thing you've just said. With every phenomena, every phenomenon, sorry, except consciousness, because I think every other phenomenon is, you know, capturing the causal structure of the universe. But this is, we don't know about it in that way. We know about it in a very different way, and so I think that gives us the entitlement to give a different credence to it because, you know, we have a very different epistemological relationship with it. Um, I think we apprehend its reality directly and we know something about its reality directly. I think, you know, when I attend to the qualities in my experience, I know something about their nature. Uh, I don't have that with tables. You know, if, if I had that with tables, if I could magically know something about their nature, then maybe, you know, that would give me less credence that physical science can explain it. But I don't have that. It's just, but with consciousness, I, I think I have some direct access to its nature. And so that's why I think I can have very different credence in the possibility of physics. So I ended up, I ended up coming back to the argument. I said I wouldn't. <laughs> Sorry. I know. And I'm biting my tongue. I have things to say. But what Sorry. I really want to say is Sorry. tell us what panpsychism actually says. Let, let's give the sales pitch. You're at a, there's, you're at a used car dealership and uh, <laughs> it's your used consciousness theory dealership. And someone has wandered onto the lot and you would like to sell them this uh, panpsychist vehicle that you've been trying to move for a long time. What is your sales pitch? Well, I mean, I think in a, in a way I've already described it, that this, um, that there's just matter, there's just what physical science describes it, describes, but, but let, let me emphasize actually how, how non-dualist it is. Because often sure. when people hear about panpsychism, they think, and I think actually, you said this a little bit in your book, actually, that you think it's, um, Oh, well, the, the, the electron has its physical properties like mass, charge and spin. And it also has these consciousness properties. And you rightfully said, you know, that, that ought to show up in our, in our physics. You know, there's these extra properties. That's not the view, right? The view is mass, spin and charge are themselves forms of consciousness, right? So physics tells us what mass, spin and charge do, but it doesn't tell us what they are, what those, what those properties are. And so... Um, so it's a radically uh, non-dualistic account, and by the very way it's set up, uh, it, it's going to be completely consistent with what with what we know scientifically. Um, how would I sell it? I mean, let me just say, can I say just briefly how I think about the science Please. of consciousness? Um, Actually, could you could you do me a favor sure. and uh, tell the very charming story that you told in the book of your conversion experience? <laughs> oh no, my wife told me to take that out because she thought it was too <laughs> cringy. <laughs> No, no, uh, it's the with, best part. Look, you know, it's uh, which, you I have guess, to. It's part of being a good sales pitch. You don't have to tell if you don't want to, but it's I in the book. I guess I've just so been through various f phases of um, always been obsessed by the problem of consciousness as far back as I can remember, and you know, what, thought I was a materialist. But the point is, you were a materialist. So I was you a materialist. You, you, yeah. yeah, you can claim to know what it's like to be a materialist. And I guess I, I eventually came to the point of view that. The somewhat Donetian point of view that if you're a materialist, you sh you that's un incompatible with the reality of the qualitative reality of consciousness, and defended that for a while whilst sort of feeling a like I was living in bad faith that I was sort of not mm. really believing, uh, and yeah, just just one night and just certain vivid experiences got to me and um, I just decided this can't go on anymore, and I mean actually, but actually. Yeah. At that point, I was taught as a philosophy undergraduate, the only two options are materialism and dualism. And I thought both of these sure. are hopeless. And I was very disillusioned. And I wrote my end of year undergraduate dissertation on how the problem of consciousness can't be resolved. And I went off and did something else. And then I discovered, <laughs> you know, panpsychism was not taught those days. And I discovered there is this elegant middle way that does accept the reality of consciousness, but is completely consistent with our empirical knowledge of the world. So I think that was the... Um, um, well, when you say something like mass, charge, and spin are properties of consciousness, is that... Is that no, they are, I, they are forms of consciousness. Forms of consciousness, okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, 
What I want to say is, what in the world does that mean? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think I think nothing is so. So, some people think you know there's a mystery of what a consciousness is. I don't. I don't think that's mm-hmm. a mystery. I think you know nothing is more obvious than you know what a feeling. You know what a feeling of pain is when you have it. You know what. You know the the mystery is how consciousness fits into our theory of the world. So you know human consciousness is very rich and complex. Consciousness of horses less so, mice less so. You know, and we keep getting simpler and simpler forms of inorganic life. Maybe at some point the lights switch off. Um, we have no consciousness at all. But it seems at least coherent that as we get simpler and simpler forms of matter, you have simpler and simpler forms of consciousness, such as. When you get to the bottom, I mean, let's just assume for the sake of simplicity, a particle ontology, which the panpsychist sure. does not necessarily have to commit to, although, you know, you often talk about that, one often talks that way for the sake of simplicity. The, an electron has an unimaginably simple form of experience. So, you know, we can't even imagine something so simple. So that seems to me a coherent view. Uh, you might think it's crazy, uh, but it seems to me at least a coherent view. Moreover... I think there's reason to take it seriously because we know that consciousness is real. We have to fit it into reality somehow. If you think materialism and dualism have got such deep problems that they're not really going to make it happen, then this gives us a way of doing it that avoids all the problems. And it feels a bit weird, but but so what? Yeah, no, I mean, weird, obviously, we're going to have to accept if we, if we talk about <laughs> any of these things. The weird is okay, but I, I really want to get a better, if I were, if I were very cynical, here'd be my problem. Um, yeah. I have an electron, I have equations for what it does. It has a mass, charge, and spin. Uh, I have the Dirac equation, I have quantum field theory, I can tell you exactly what it will do. Um, as the materialist physicist, I'm tempted to say... I'm done. I know mm-hmm. what the electron is and, and how it behaves. And you want to say, and it has some very, very primitive, limited form of conscious experience. Is that fair? But the, it depends what you mean by and. That's not a further property. Yeah. I'm saying you've told me what mass does. Yeah. But... You haven't told me what it is. That's the that's the right. Yeah. So there's something I haven't told you yet. I guess maybe let's yeah. just put it yeah. that way. Sure. So there's sure. something extra that I haven't yet told you. Sure. And but that something extra I haven't yet told you has no mathematical description. Yeah. Absolutely. That's right. And it also has. Does it have causal influences on the behavior of anything? Yeah. The thought is, you've been telling me this cool story about what mass does and then the panpsychist view is mass is a form of consciousness so it's actually it's it's this form of consciousness that's been doing all the stuff you've been talking about i mean it's not like there's the consciousness and then there's something else there's just the forms of consciousness and you've been telling me what they do so it's like you know you i don't know you you hear someone banging in the apartment downstairs and something's you know something's making this noise but you don't know what it is and then you discover it's an elephant. I don't know. Uh, so, so <laughs> you you physicists study what these properties do, but on this view, you're not saying what they are. That's the yeah. But uh, maybe maybe I'm um, not getting this exactly right. Is so mass is a form of consciousness. Yeah. Uh, is that because everything is a form of consciousness? Or th- these physical properties are forms of consciousness. Is the wave function of the universe a form of consciousness? Yeah. So look, it depends on what what you think the fundamental ontology is. That so the panpsychist view is, whatever your fundamental physical story is, that will give you some structure. But then you've got to ask, well, what realizes that structure? And mm-hmm. what realizes that structure are forms of consciousness. So if you have a particle based ontology, then these particles will sure. have intrinsic if you've got a wave sorry if you've got a a wave function ontology then you have to think about that the, the wave function has uh its intrinsic nature is consciousness involving um so th- th- i was just asking does everything have this is this is part of the panpsychist um <clears throat> view that everything has an aspect of consciousness everything at the fundamental level so the panpsychist yeah. need not hold it like <laughs> 
rocks and socks and you know beds are conscious uh not every mm-hmm. arbitrary collection of things is conscious but everything has components or or its most basic parts are conscious or or the or the physical reality that underlies it at least has a consciousness involving nature that's the view but but okay but i'm just trying to get straight I, as a materialist who doesn't use those words, have a theory of what does happen in the world. And your theory of what does happen in the world, your theory as a panpsychist, need not be any different from mine, right? Right. Exactly. That's the that's that's taken to be the benefit of the view, right? We 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 don't want our theory of consciousness to get in the way of physics, right? Yeah. Right. But okay, so this is where, you know, I think that the zombie uh, thought experiment is actually helpful, because if it's true that uh, there's different versions of the zombie thought experiment, so let me just always conditionalize on various assumptions here. If it's true that given the atoms and particles and forces in me, including in my brain and my neurons and so forth, I could in principle be Laplace's demon and solve the laws of physics and say exactly what I would do modulo quantum uncertainty and so forth. Um, And that would include things like showing me something red and me saying, oh, yes, that is red. I am experiencing red. Um, And there and all that goes through perfectly well in both of our different uh, views of the world. Then I'm not quite sure what is added by the panpsychist perspective. Um. In other words, let me let me well, give you the very short the version gum. of that. Mm-hmm. So, if I if the zombie is David Chalmers's idea of a uh, you know a physical thing that acts exactly like things in the real world, a physical yeah, uh, yeah. collection of atoms and so forth, um, but that does not have consciousness. And my point is, if it exacts, if it acts exactly the same, mm-hmm. that includes when you ask it, "Do you have consciousness? Are you experiencing things?" It says yes. And yeah. if you ask it, "Are you lying?" It says no. So clearly, it honestly thinks it's conscious, yes. but it's not by hypothesis. Yes. So. It, by that, therefore, none of us knows that we're not a zombie because zombies think that they're conscious just like we do. And therefore, you've really added nothing. <laughs> OK, this sounds a little bit different to what you said the first time. I mean, the first time you, you, you seem to be saying, well, just brutally, what's the difference between a world that's physically identical and lacks consciousness and one that's... I mean, I don't know how to say it, McClure, but the, in the sense that when we describe physical reality, we use these quantitative concepts... When we describe consciousness, we use these qualitative concepts. We talk about, you know, colors and smells and, and the, the qualitative character. It seems to perfectly coherent to hypothesize that you might have one without the other. Um, but but coming to your, you know, uh, a second argument, as, I, as I'm understanding it, well, doesn't this imply... None of us would know we were conscious. I mean, there are, there are tricky issues here, actually, just as a preliminary thought about the relationship between thought and consciousness. So the, the dominant view in my philosophical tradition has been that thought has nothing to do with consciousness. And you can see this because the dominant <laughs> theories of thought in the 20th century, such as Jerry Fodor or Donald Davidson or Dennett, have absolutely nothing to say about consciousness. So they think you can give a complete account of thought without talking about consciousness. And so on that view... They're more about computation and so forth? Yeah, some kind of functional behavioral facts or... Yeah. uh, Very, 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 very broadly speaking. Um, So on that view, a zombie would, would have thoughts and would think it's conscious, as you say. But I mean, I'm actually one of a growing minority of philosophers who think actually thought is a kind of consciousness... Uh, and, and and if that's true, then um, the zombie wouldn't have any thoughts at all. Um, so that's, I mean, that's one way you can go with this, but maybe that's getting into slightly contentious territory. But, I mean, the other thing to say is, yeah, the zombie behaves in all the same ways, but I don't know about my consciousness. It's not the case that I know about my consciousness by observing myself. I know about it because I'm immediately aware of my own experiences. Um, but that's that, just what a zombie would say. It would say that, but it's it's not true of the zombie by stipulation. Um, it doesn't have this. What justifies, what grounds my knowledge of consciousness is my immediate awareness of my own pain. Um, 
and by stipulation that's what a zombie lacks uh yeah i don't know <laughs> where to go with this other right. to say that yeah no, I think both of our positions are out there. This, that's all I, I ever ask for yeah. in the podcast is that people understand what uh, both sides are saying. <laughs> sure. So let's let's uh, be a little bit more, um, you know, future oriented and, and proactive. How do you think, uh, what do you think of the uh, prospects for consciousness and panpsychism? I mean, you, you try to end the book sure. on an uplifting note, and I think it's an interesting sure. perspective to uh, conclude with. Sure. So I think, you know, this view's been getting taken much more seriously in academic philosophy. Um, and, you know, part of the reason I wrote this book, I've written an academic book, Consciousness and Fundamental Reality, which is kind of reasonably well known, uh, bringing together a lot of this recent literature. You know, there's been a huge amount published on this view. But, you know, I really want to get it out to a broader audience because it's not really a complete view, this Russell Eddington view. It's a, it's a framework, uh, and it will take you know, decades or centuries of interdisciplinary labor to fill in the details, you know, just as Darwin's principle of natural selection is, um, you know, is a basic framework for understanding how life evolves, but then it takes, you know, a century to get to DNA. Um, so, so really, I think, you know, this is going to be, you know, I, I just think people are nat naturally conservative. It's, it's hard to persuade people with arguments, but I just think, you know, we need to get on with this if, if, if enough people are on board with trying to do this. Uh, and there's, you know, there, there's all very kind of very interesting work going on. Um, well, let me just say, actually, maybe I could just say about how I think about this, the, the science of consciousness. Um, mm -hmm. So, and this relates to materialism as well, because um, I think the science of consciousness has to have an empirical aspect and a theoretical aspect. I think some people think you can just do the empirical bit, but I think you know neuroscience, as vital as it is, just gives you correlations. To move beyond that, we need to build build a theory. Um, and I think I, I think a, a theory of consciousness should be judged by two constraints. Uh, this is going a little bit beyond what I say in the book, actually. An an external constraint mm -hmm. and an internal constraint. So the external constraint is just to, to fit the data obviously crucial. The internal constraint is to try and minimize or ideally eliminate explanatory gaps. That is, places in the theory where you're going from one set of facts to another with no account of how that happens. So the problem with materialism, materialism isn't just looking at the neuroscience, it's a theory in its own right, and it has an enormous, on the face of it, explanatory gap between the quantitative properties and the qualitative reality of consciousness. I think already the Russell Eddington view makes progress there because we now have an intelligible account of the relationship between physical states and conscious states. Conscious states are the intrinsic nature of physical states. So I think there's already explanatory progress there, but there's plenty of work to be done. And, and so, I mean, the, the crucial next step is how we think about the relationship between particle consciousness or consciousness at lower levels and consciousness at higher levels. Is this a causal relationship in the sense that we need basic laws of nature to, to make the gap? Or is this a constitutive relationship um, in the sense that, you know, in some sense, the higher level forms of consciousness come for free once you've got the more basic forms of consciousness? And how do we make sense of that? So there's lots of, you know, tricky issues here. And there's already really interesting work going on. So Hedda Hassel Merck, who's a research fellow at um, University of Oslo, spent a year in recently in the lab of Giulio Tononi, who is the founder of the Integrated Information Theory of Consciousness, one of the most best empirically supported theories of consciousness, working that out in a um, in the framework of Russell Eddington panpsychism, and what we end up with is a view according to which in any system the co the the consciousness intrinsic nature is at the level at which there's most integrated information. So I think so. this works with the neuroscientific theory, but like any neuroscientific theory, if you've just got the neuroscience, you've just got a correlation. But interpreting it in this Russell Eddington framework moves beyond the Burr correlation and gives you a deeper explanation. Um, you've got uh, well, another thing I talk about in the book, the Luke Roloffs, who's uh, the University of Bochum, reflecting on whether uh, split-brain patients can help 
shed light on mental mm-hmm. combinations. So these are the curious cases where people people have the corpus callosum in the middle of their brain split, which allows the two hemispheres to communicate a radical treatment for epilepsy. And it seems to lead to a kind of peculiar fragmentation of consciousness. It ends up looking like there's sort of two conscious minds in one person. So Roloff's interest in this is, well, this split brain case is a kind of the converse of mental combination. In mental combination, we're trying to understand how distinct conscious subjects can combine to a single unified conscious subject whereas in split brain cases you've got a single conscious mind fragmenting into multiple conscious minds so if we can sort of understand what's going on in the split brain case and as it were reverse engineer it this might shed light on mental combination so there's all, what we need is philosophers in labs uh, or philosophers thinking about how do we make sense of this panpsychist view in a wave function fundamental view which i've been actually thinking about actually for something I'm writing for a, an OUP volume on quantum mechanics and consciousness. So, you know, I think this needs to be an interdisciplinary labor that's just in its birth. And I think people, you know, it's going to take it much more seriously in academic philosophy, although, you know, you sometimes people not entirely comfortable with this. But I think rather <laughs> than persuading people with the arguments, if we just get on with the work, I think history shows that once you just get on and start doing some research, and this bears fruit, I think that's when people start to listen a bit more. So, so I'm very optimistic that that there's a, a lot of interesting work to be done. Sorry, that was a bit long. Yeah, no, I like, uh, I no, 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 it, it, it's what I was hoping for. Um, it, it does sound one way or the other, whatever our bets are that's going to happen for what's going to happen in the future. Uh, I am optimistic that the right people are beginning to talk to each other and taking these problems seriously. Like I said, I am someone who believes in consciousness as a real thing. I would like to understand it. I don't think that we entirely do. Um, Final issue, final question, very quickly. uh, What do you think, how do you conceptualize the possible moral or ethical implications of this kind of thing? I know that we can't, there's not a simple road from ought to is, but everyone agrees that science and philosophy, uh, philosophical ideas about consciousness could have an impact on how we think about morality and ethics. Do you uh, have special thoughts about that? Yeah, a little bit. I talk about this a little bit in in the in the final, more sort of experimental chapter of the book. I mean, first I would say, you know, of course, as I'm sure you'd agree, we shouldn't be thinking about which view we'd most like to be true. We should be thinking about which mm-hmm. view is most likely to be true. And I think there's, you know, very good reasons for taking panpsychism seriously as the best account of how consciousness fits into nature. But I am also inclined to think that it's maybe a view that's slightly better for our mental and spiritual health in the kind of broad sense. I mean, kind of, you know, materialism is pretty bleak in a way. You know, you've got a kind of mechanistic picture of nature and the, the cold immensity of empty space. And uh, Whereas, you know, in Panpsychist's view, we are conscious creatures in a conscious universe. It's, you know, it is somewhat, we can feel a little bit perhaps more comfortable in our own skin. And, and so, you know, actually also I think it, has the potential, perhaps, something I talk about in the book, to improve our relationship to the environment. I mean, if you think, if you think trees and plants are just unfeeling mechanisms, then I think inevitably your view of their value is indirect. Their value is indirect in terms of, you know, the effect it has on us conscious creatures looking pretty or, more importantly, maintaining our survival but uh you know if you think a tree is uh you know in some sense a conscious entity in its own right then i think that's a object of immediate moral concern you know it's a uh, chopping down a tree is something that has an, an immediate moral focus so i do think perhaps this gives us you know we're in this environmental crisis that we can't seem to deal with for all sorts of reasons and this might help a little bit um how we relate to nature and the environment although of course that shouldn't be the reason to take it seriously. <coughs> oh, no, I, that's right. You don't uh, you don't accept a view because you want it to be true. But I think it's p- perfectly legitimate to say, well, I think this view is yeah. true, and I'm relieved and happy that <laughs> that it is. I think that's sure. perfectly yeah. legit. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks so much. There's a lot to think about here. Philip Goff, thanks for being on the podcast. Thanks a lot, Sean. That's been really enjoyed that vigorous debate. Thanks for having me.